Good evening. Joining us in the session are people from five different continents. So I should open by saying good evening, good morning, or good night, depending on your geographical location. So far, we have over 300 connections, friends, family, and a large representation of past and present Israel Air Force warriors. My name is Saul Simon, and I'm Smokey Simon's son. It is a true honor to open this event. Five days ago, we celebrated Smokey's 100th birthday, and today we're celebrating Israel's 72nd birthday. Smokey was one of the few volunteers who came to the aid of his Jewish brethren in the fight for independence. His important role in the Air Force, as well as his vivid memory, enable us to hear today from the man himself one of the more exciting stories of Israel's brief history. The story of the Machalniks, the volunteers from abroad, and their crucial role during the War of Independence. Just a few housekeeping notes. Due to the number of participants and bandwidth concerns, we have switched off all mics and are asking you please to switch off your video cameras. Smokey will be talking for about 35 to 40 minutes, after which he will take questions. You can enter your questions into the chat window of this Zoom session. Thank you all for being with us. Smokes, the mic is yours. Greetings and salutations to all. As the first Chief of Air Operations in the Israel Air Force, 1948 to 1950, it is indeed my pleasure to share some reflections and impressions relating to Israel's War of Independence and to the role of Mahal, volunteers from abroad in this war, and to the birth of the Israel Air Force, IAF. The decade of the 1940s was a decade of momentous events. World War II was raging over six years, 1939 to 1945. Germany surrendered in May 1945 and Japan in August 45. Thousands of Holocaust survivors and displaced Jews were seeking a refuge in Palestine whilst facing a brutal British naval blockade. The British mandate over Palestine was due to terminate at midnight on 14th, 15th May. Ben Gurion declared the establishment of the State of Israel on Friday, 14th May. From an historical perspective, the declaration of the State of Israel and the War of Independence were the pinnacles of 2,000 years of Jewish history. An ancient nation returning to its ancient land after 2,000 years of exile and dispersion. There was an abundance of predictions of doom for Israel, including from George Marshall, U.S. Secretary of State, Ernest Bevan, British Foreign Minister, General Montgomery, hero of the Battle of El Alamein, who stated, when the British flag is lowered over Palestine, the Jews will be wiped out. Abdul Azam Pasha, General Secretary of the Arab League, stated, 
if the Zionists dare to declare a state, the massacre that will be unleashed on them will dwarf what Hitler had done to the Jewish people. This will be a war of extinction. The War of Independence was Israel's longest war. May 48 to January 49, eight months. It was Israel's costliest war. 6,300 military and civilian lives were lost out of a population of 650,000. And it was Israel's most faithful war. If this war had been lost, the prayers, hopes and dreams of 2,000 years would have vanished into thin air. Six Arab armies stood ready to obliterate the newborn state of Israel. Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Kaupti's army of liberation. There was an overwhelming imbalance of forces in favor of the Arabs. Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq were equipped by the British, and Syria and Lebanon by the French. For example, the Egyptians had 62 frontline combat aircraft, British Spitfires and Italian Mackies, and Israel did not even have a single combat aircraft or a single anti-aircraft gun. To exacerbate Israel's situation, there was a United Nations embargo on the export of military equipment to the Middle East, and the American neutrality law was reenacted, which made it a serious offense for American citizens to serve in a foreign army. This meant that the American FBI and CIA and the British MI5 and the United Nations observers were all arraigned against Israel. Let me give a brief personal background. I served in the South African Air Force in World War II for five years as a navigator bombardier. My wife, Myra, was a meteorologist in the South African Air Force. I am indeed very thankful to have Myra at age 93 by my side. As the war clouds were gathering over Palestine, the South African Zionist Federation got in touch with ex-servicemen from World War II, asking them to support their brethren in Israel in the imminent war with the Arabs. Myra and I decided to join the battle for the Jewish homeland, and we were part of the first group of volunteers from South Africa. We arrived in Palestine on 9th May 1948, and the next day we signed on to serve in the newborn Israel Air Force. As mentioned, I had the high privilege of serving as Chief of Air Operations 
of the IAF and Myra served as a meteorologist in the Air Force. On Friday 14th of May, I had the privilege of flying on the very first operational mission of the IAF, a reconnaissance flight over Syria and Jordan to report on the Arab forces heading towards Israel. The situation looked very grim indeed. This flight was also rather unique, as at the very time of our flight, Ben Gurion was declaring the establishment of the State of Israel. When we took off on the flight, the airfield was located in Tel Aviv, Palestine. But when we landed a few hours later at the same airfield, its location was Tel Aviv, Israel. The war started badly for Israel. The Etzion block was burnt down to the ground by the Jordanian army. The road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was cut off. Jerusalem was under a siege, resulting in a shortage of food, water, and armaments. Tel Aviv was under air attacks by the Egyptian Air Force, day after day, causing very heavy casualties. By 29th May, the Egyptian army had overrun the kibbutzim in the south and had advanced up to Ashdod, 30 kilometers from Tel Aviv. The Egyptian objective was to capture Tel Aviv, where the provisional government of Israel was located. Had they succeeded, the War of Independence would have been lost. Shimon Avidan, commander of the Israeli forces on the Tel Aviv front, was in a desperately difficult situation. Enter the Machel story. 4,800 Macheliks volunteers from abroad, including 168 non-Jews, came from 59 countries to fight with their brethren in Israel. The Machelniks included 426 flying personnel, pilots, navigators, radio operators, radar experts, and air gunners. They were mainly veterans of World War II, and their wartime experience and professional expertise were of invaluable importance to the Israel Defense Forces. The Machelniks included men of tremendous stature, Mickey Marcus, an ex-colonel in the U.S. Army, was appointed by Ben Gurion as the first aloof general of the IDF. Mickey was responsible for the defense of Jerusalem and for building a second road to Jerusalem. He was unfortunately killed in a tragic accident. Paul Schulman was appointed commander of the Israeli Navy. Ben Dunkelman, a highly decorated Canadian officer, was appointed to command the 7th Brigade. Teddy Defray, a non-Jew, commanded the French and 
Moroccan Machelniks. Now enter the Israel Air Force, the IAF. The Air Force was born in the heat of battle. Since 95% of the operational flying personnel were Machelniks who were not Hebrew speakers, the official operational language of the IAF was English. At the start of the war, we had no option but to use a small number of light civilian aircraft as bombers by manually releasing 25 kilo bombs out of the window of the aircraft. Fortunately, two outstanding ex-US Air Force Machelniks appeared on the scene, Al Schremer and Sam Pomerantz. Al was a man of vision and tremendous courage. With Israel cut off by land and by sea, he realized that air transportation was absolutely vital for Israel's survival. He was prepared to violate the UN arms embargo and the US Neutrality Act and to risk his citizenship by smuggling aircraft out of the US. The IAF had two formidable challenges. Firstly, how to acquire aircraft. And secondly, how to get these aircraft to Israel. Al organized a group of Air Force veterans to acquire World War II aircraft. As the emphasis was firstly on large transport aircraft, ALS Group acquired 11 C-46s, two C-54 Skymasters, one Constellation, and four B-17 heavy bombers. To evade the FBI and CIA, the aircraft were dispersed at different airfields and then smuggled out of the U.S. via a bogus commercial airline which was established by Schwimmer. To avoid capture, the smuggled aircraft were flown via Brazil, Panama, the Caribbean, crossing the Atlantic into Africa by different routes, and then across the Mediterranean to Corsica, and finally to Czechoslovakia. It must be stressed at this point that Czechoslovakia was the one and only country which came to Israel's aid in the War of Independence. Israel has an everlasting debt of gratitude to Czechoslovakia. This smuggling operation was, in my humble opinion, the most honorable, ethical, and moral smuggling operation in history. The only fighter planes which could be purchased at the time were 25 Messerschmitt ME-109 planes from Czechoslovakia. These aircraft were dissembled in Czechoslovakia, packed into the C-46s and C-54s large transport planes, and flown from Czechoslovakia to Telnov, Israel by night. 
as the Egyptian Air Force dominated the skies above Israel during daylight hours. This air bridge between Czechoslovakia and Israel truly became Israel's lifeline. This transport unit was named Air Transport Command ATC. So, back to May 29th, 1948. The Egyptian army, which had reached Ashdod, was about to launch their final assault on Tel Aviv. On that same day, the assembly of the first four ME-109s had been completed in the strictest of secrecy. Without having test flown the aircraft and without having tested the armament systems, this warship attacked the Egyptian army at Ashdod. The element of surprise was of paramount importance. One bomb hit a petrol bowser, which exploded into flames and started a series of fires. The Egyptians were stunned and destabilized by this totally unexpected air attack and started to disperse. The intended attack on Tel Aviv was thwarted. The fortship was led by Lou Lennart, an ex-U.S. Marine pilot, and his three fellow pilots were Eddie Cohen, a South African Mahonik who was unfortunately killed in the attack, and two outstanding Israelis, Asa Weizmann and Madi Alon. The site of this critical battle was named Ad Halom, in English, until here. I refer to 29th May 1948 as Israel's Day of Survival. I would add that this very first mission by the IAF fighter planes may arguably have been the single most important mission in the history of the IAF. To paraphrase the Churchill, never was so much been owed by so many to so few. The first ceasefire in the war was set by the Security Council to take effect in June 48. The Air Force was anxious to demonstrate a show of force by bombing Damascus prior to the ceasefire. Since we had no bombers, comma, we borrowed a DC-3 Dakota from a friendly Jewish-owned aviation company in South Africa. We removed all the aircraft seats and erased all civil markings on the fuselage of the aircraft. We loaded the aircraft with 16 80 kilo bombs and several cases of empty bottles. The bombs were dropped manually by a team of bomb chuckers. They were tied with ropes, one to the other, to prevent them from falling out of the aircraft together with the bombs when they were dropped. We did six runs over the city to give the impression that a number of aircraft were involved in the attack. At the end of the bombing runs, we dropped the bottles, which created a shrieking noise as they flew through the air. 
The psychological effect of the attack was significant in that the following day, all foreigners left Damascus as it was no longer considered to be a safe city. Later on, Israel was able to purchase 50 Spitfires from Czechoslovakia. But soon after this purchase, comma, the air bridge between Czechoslovakia and Israel was stopped due to international pressure, thus making it impossible to get these aircraft to Israel. This grave situation was saved by one Machelnik, Sam Pomerantz, a US pilot and aviation engineer. Sam achieved the impossible by increasing the flying endurance of the Spitfires from one and a half to six hours. He stripped the aircraft of their defensive armor, their guns and cannons, as well as their navigation and communication equipment. He placed fuel tanks under the belly and under the wings and even in the cockpits of the aircraft. Sam increased the fuel capacity of the aircraft from 85 to 379 gallons, which increased the Spitfire's endurance by 400%. On their way to Israel, these aircraft, without radio communication, were led by a C-46 mothership. They completed the six-hour flight, landing in Israel on their last drops of fuel. Two outstanding young Israeli pilots who had just completed their training course were part of this mission, Motty Hod and Danny Shapiro. Five of these ferry flights Operation Velveta brought 22 Spitfires to Israel in time for Operation Horeb. Unfortunately, while flying in a severe snowstorm, Sam was killed. When the sad news was conveyed to Sam's wife, who was non-Jewish, she said, Sam could not have died for a greater cause. Another example of great ingenuity was the building of a homemade radar by a group of highly talented Machelniks, all radar experts from World War II. They were able to build a functional radar from scraps left over by the British. To demonstrate the ingenuity, the radar antenna span and elevation movement was activated by soldiers treading bicycle pedals. The enemy was never aware of this technology, which gave Israel the advantage of early detection of penetrating aircraft. The radar enabled us to intercept and to shoot down a high-flying Royal Air Force reconnaissance mosquito, which regularly photographed the IAF bases. We believe the British shared this intelligence with the Egyptian Air Force. This innovative spirit might have been 
early signs of the startup nation. Turn of the tide. As more machelniks were arriving, and as the ground forces were being better equipped and experienced, the IDF was moving from the defensive into an offensive mode. By October 48, the central Negev, the Beersheba area, was liberated. The 7th Brigade was liberating the Galilee area. The IAF had bombed Amman, Damascus, Cairo, and Gaza. The IAF was decimating the Egyptian Air Force. Fourteen fighters were shot down in air-to-air -air battles, and many Egyptian aircraft were destroyed in attacks on El Arish and Bir Hama airfields. The King Farouk, the flagship of the Egyptian Navy, was sunk by Israeli and Machal commandos. The ground forces were consolidating for the final offensive, Operation Horeb, with the objective of expelling the Egyptians out of the Negev. The IAF participated in this operation with its entire force, 24 Spitfires, two Mustangs, three B-17 bombers, ten Harvard, ten Norsemen, C-46s, and DC-3s. The cooperation and coordination between the Air Force and ground forces throughout the 17-day operation December 22nd to 7th January 49, with the IDF driving the Egyptians deeply back into Sinai. The United Nations Security Council had decreed a final ceasefire on 7th January 1949. This was indeed a day of high drama. Two Israeli Spitfires from 101 Squadron, piloted by two Machleniks, were on patrol over the battle area. When they observed four Spitfires approaching from Egypt, the two Israeli pilots engaged the oncoming Spitfires and shot down three of them. The fourth Spitfire was shot down by a tank crew of Machoniks who manned a Centurion tank which had been stolen by deserters from the British Army. To the IAF's total surprise, the four invading aircraft were British Royal Air Force RAF planes. When they failed to return to their base, the RAF sent a formation of 19 fighters to the battle area, four Spitfires and 15 Tempests. Four Machal pilots engaged this formation, shooting down one Tempest and damaging five others. The IAF then decided to disengage from the air battle after a day of five British kills and five aircraft damage. There was, of course, serious concern as to how the Brits may react, and a special staff meeting was held on this matter, 
And here we have a humor story. Following the staff meeting, an American Masonic who came out of the meeting was approached by an English Masonic who asked Danny, what in the hell is going to happen? Danny responded with a straight face and said, Maury, this is top secret. The IAF has decided to bomb London. Maury, with an equally straight face, responded, Danny, I couldn't care less. I come from Manchester. Amongst the many ironies and anomalies in the War of Independence, I'd like to quote Gordon Levitt, a 101 squadron and ATC pilot, who said, Here I find myself a British non-Jew serving in a Jewish Air Force, flying a German Messerschmitt, which was smuggled out of Czechoslovakia by Jewish and non-Jewish Mahoniks. And one last humorous story. Morton Rubenfeld, an American pilot, had just arrived at the 101 Fighter Squadron. On the very next day, on his first flight, he was badly shot up when attacking an Iraqi column near Tulkarum. He couldn't make it back to base and bailed out on the shoreline near Kafar Vitkin. Moshavniks came rushing to the scene with pitchforks and rifles. Morton feared they might think he was an Egyptian pilot, as the Egyptian Air Force had been bombing Israel on a daily basis. In order to identify himself as a Jewish pilot, but not knowing a word of Hebrew, he ran towards the Moshevniks with his hands raised and kept yelling, Shabbos, gefilte fish! Shabbos, gefilte fish! The Israelis embraced him and took him to hospital for a checkup. Just a few concluding remarks. Considering the initial overwhelming Arab superiority in aircraft, tanks, armored cars, artillery, and troops, Israel's victory was a near miracle. There is no parallel in military history. The Machelniks played a pivotal role in three respects. Towards winning the war, training the Israelis, and helping to lay the foundations on which the IDF has been based. To sum up, Ben-Gurion stated, the Machal forces were the diaspora's greatest contribution to Israel's survival. In 1995, at the dedication of the Machal Memorial at Shar Haggai, Yitzhak Rabin, then Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, stated, You came to us when we needed you most. During those dark and uncertain days in our war of independence. The people of Israel and the state of Israel will forever cherish the Machal contribution to Israel's survival. In December 2018, Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot issued a formal citation 
by the IDF on Machel's role in the War of Independence. And on a final note, there are over 80 Christian states and over 50 Muslim states in the world, and God willing, there will be one Jewish state, the state of Israel, to the end of time. Chag Atzma'ud Sameach, Am Yisrael Chai, and bless you all. Okay, folks, thank you. I'm sure Smokey covered uh, the entire uh, spectrum of uh, the War of Independence. So many, many thanks, and what a wonderful opportunity to have you with us 72 years later, reminding us of this incredible period in the history of the Jewish people. And uh, thanks for bringing all this valuable information back into our memories and minds. So, Daraba. I just want to thank Saul and Eliza for their wonderful performance in setting up this broadcast. I'm truly, deeply grateful to them. Bless you and thank you again. We see there are some questions coming in. So the only reason we're using one computer is to reduce bandwidth. And I'm just uh, waiting on questions. Uh, uh, Smokes, the first, the first question is, how many of the uh, Mahomiks are, are still around um, today? The answer is, unfortunately, very few. Uh, the vast majority of the Machleniks have really passed on into the eternal world. But every year we do have a Machal memorial service on Yom HaZikaron. Unfortunately, we couldn't have it this year, but we try to keep up the um, the memory of those Machalniks who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Oh. Um, I should add at this point that there are about 400 new Machalniks uh, um, being enlisted into the IDF uh, every year. And um, I take the opportunity of talking to them about the start of Machal and the traditions and the history and the importance of volunteering in the defense of the Jewish homeland. Another question. Uh how was the integration with the unexperienced Israeli pilots during that period? Uh, there were really a very limited number of Israeli pilots who had been trained by the British uh, towards the end of World War II. Uh, very few of them had operational experience in World War II, but they turned out to be magnificent pilots. And the important thing is that the experienced Machleniks, a group stayed on after the war to train the Israelis. And in fact, the first wings parade took place on the 4th of January, um, two, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 1949, when four Israelis got their wing, they turned out to be a wonderful group of pilots of the highest caliber. Another question, and you mentioned it briefly, what was your role? And uh, what was uh, your service following the war? And as 
I mentioned, um, I served in the Air Force for two and a half years. Um, from May 1948 uh, to the end of October uh, um, uh, uh, 1950. Uh, uh, Maya Ray had served in the Meteorological Service, and uh, so we were really um, Air Force uh, personnel. And uh, what was the second part? And, and you're wrong. It's been just oh, originally mentioned. I was. I was appointed a chief of air operations, which really was a tremendous privilege because it gave me a frontline seat to what was happening in this high drama that was taking place and uh, the, the uh, critical importance of it in the uh, destiny and the history of the Jewish people. Uh, I might add, I had a 24, I participated in 24 operational missions. I tried to combine my flying activities together with my job as chief of air operations. I would have liked to have been more active on the operational front but I really made the best uh, effort uh, uh, of, my, uh, of my contribution. Regarding the post war, uh, briefly, what happened to you after the war? Um, my wife, Myra, and I decided that we are going to come in Aliyah. I had served in World War II for five years. I volunteered to serve in the South African Air Force um, in January um, uh, 1941, uh, just after I had qualified as a Bachelor of Commerce and a Chartered Accountant, uh, which meant that I never really had an opportunity uh, to uh, develop my personal career. So uh, we, uh, Myra and I, decided that we would go back to South Africa after my service in the Israel Air Force for a period of 10 years. And after 11 years, we returned to Israel with our four children. Uh, I set up an insurance agency. I had been in the same business in South Africa for 11 years, and um, uh, I happily was very successful in developing a successful business. Um, a follow up question. Um, I'm sure the answer is simple. What is your secret to your long life? Um, I can really reply in one word, uh, gratitude. You know, I have, after all, I've been through five years in World War II and two and a half years in the Israel Air Force. And uh, thank God I emerged intact. Um, and um, um, I really believe that I am so grateful, uh, really, for my um, uh, for my life and for my well-being. Uh, uh, Myra and I have four wonderful children, uh, fifteen grandchildren, uh, eighteen great-grandchildren, and please God, number nineteen is on the way. So, as I said, I can really uh, uh, reply in one word, a gratitude to the Almighty and to my good fortune. Just another um, note, in addition to Above and Beyond, there's a wonderful book 
on the story of the Machalniks, Angels in the Sky. Uh, you may want to um, read that. Um, is there anything special you would like to do with the new Machalniks? Is there anything you'd like to do uh, special this year with the new Machalniks when you meet with them? Um, really, uh, it's a case of extending a very warm and hearty um, recognition of their decision to, um, to serve in the idea. And I feel that I would like to offer the utmost encouragement and inspiration of which I'm capable, uh, because it really is an extraordinary experience for young Jews from abroad to come and serve in the IDF. Uh, it's a noble act, uh, it's a wonderful act, and uh, I feel that I can play a small part in giving them encouragement and inspiration. Fine, folks, thank you very much for those questions. And once again, Smokes, thank you very much for this enlightening uh, speech. And we wish you all uh, a wonderful 73rd year uh, for uh, Israel since Israel's independence and thanks again for attending this event. Bye-bye to you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye.